I'm Johnny White. This is Creative Current, and uh, we have the pleasure today of talking with Michael Ginsberg, uh, one of the filmmakers of Hollywood Seagull, playing right now at the Independent Downtown Theater. Michael. Hey, Johnny. Nice hey. to see you. Nice to see you. Thank you for coming, sir. So, um, sadly, uh, your collaborator uh, was unable to be here today, but I'd like to shout out to her, yeah. Lara. Lara. Hi, Lara. Lara Romanoff from, from Russia, and, uh, and she's the star of our film, and she's couldn't make it because she's got a, a bad cold. And so now you started off your career as a novelist. Yes, sir. I was a novelist in New York City, in Paris, France, and uh, then I moved to Los Angeles and became a screenwriter. And uh, ended up actually writing a lot of scripts for Russian producers, and that's how I fell in with the Russians, and that led to the uh, Chekhov, ultimately. So you came to Los Angeles. Okay, you're a successful novelist in, in New York. Most of your success in Paris. You're, you're a favorite of the Parisians. Yeah, I somehow clicked with the Parisians. My first book was called Beam Me Up, Scotty, and it was a dark comedy set on the streets of New York. Um, a bit of a vigilante story, but with some depth and some philosophical um, resonance and some humor that the French really liked. Did so, the Gene Roddenberry estate just attack you? No, because apparently they'd never actually said that in any episode of Star Trek. It was always uh, two to beam up, Scotty, or uh, that's so funny. Beam us because one thinks or, it's beam me up, Scotty. No, it was never said. And um, actually, strangely enough, shortly thereafter, James Doohan, who played Scotty, came out with his biography, and it was called Beam Me Up, Scotty, but it had no comma. Mine has a comma, so that's the way to tell them apart. Nice, yeah. nice. So, so you had the success with this novel. You had a further career with novels. What made you decide to come to LA to write screenwriting? Well, I was, on my, I was on my way to Paris and, uh, and got an offer from, uh, from a director that uh, optioned one of my, one of my uh, books. And so he wanted me to write an original script with him. So I came out here and did that and, uh, and liked it. And being a New Yorker, I fell in love with the, you know, the, the beautiful mountains and beaches and all that stuff. So you had uh, the opportunity to take your own novel and, and adapt the screenplay. I've done that a couple times. And ha yeah. has, have they gone into production? No, they were, uh, they were optioned and, and went in through a lot of sort of uh, legendary, with me at least, Hollywood stories. I was driving a truck in New York for a living and Val Kilmer came and brought me to lunch at the Relton Hotel and promised to bring me to New Mexico and introduce me to his buffaloes. And, then he disappeared. I mean, there were all sorts of characters that showed up. It was, it was rather interesting uh, being a novelist and being courted by Hollywood from a distance. So, but when I came here, uh, I met a lot of cool people, and, uh, but no one actually uh, really had the balls to do that film, because that's really, that's edgy stuff. And, the Beam Me uh, Up Scotty. Beam Me Up Scotty, yeah. Did someone option like, it to actually write the screenplay? Oh yeah, many people have optioned it. I've had, it's been, you know, here, in, not many, I'd say like a bunch. But three or four. Yeah. So what, what, what made you decide to go off? Because the, um, the film that you did make and the mm -hmm. screenplay that you did make with, with Lara yeah. um, uh, was a Chekhov. But why not your own film? Why not your own novel? Uh, well, it was Lara, Lara pretty much, uh, when I met her, uh, we started uh, talking about projects we could collaborate on. And, um, and so I wrote a script for her that was... Um, basically set in a strip club. It was about a, a Russian stripper, the ghost of a Russian stripper, who comes back and haunts a strip, strip club, which is actually a front for KGB, Illuminati, alien oligarchs, basically. And it, so uh, it was pretty silly, but it was, it was fun stuff. And it didn't get bought. So we decided to do something a little more serious, and she had the really cool... Did life. you actually make that as well? We didn't. We shopped it in Russia and almost had it made, and we had a couple of, uh, we had a couple of close, close financing opportunities, but it didn't happen. What, so. was, what was its title? It was called Wild Cherries. Wild Cherries. Nice. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Right. So anyway, I think there were a couple of porn sites with the same name, too. So what are you, what are you going to do? So. But anyway, it's a great story. So she, um, did, who, who thought of the checkoff? It was her idea, straight up. She had this revelation. Um, we, were, we were actually sitting uh, at lunch one day, and my mom, who is uh, an actress herself, comes from New York and visits, and her boyfriend's a filmmaker. And we were just sitting there. And since Laura was an actress, my mom was an actress, there was just this weird sort of uh, 
seagull vibe going around. Yes. Laura said, hey, it's just like the seagull, this sort of age difference and all this sort of, uh, you know, this weird nuanced uh, language being thrown around and double entendres and snippy intellectuality. So is your mother in the, in the movie? My mother's not in the movie. You didn't oh, cast your mother, the uh, actress. Indirectly. I mean, there are bits of her that are in the, uh, are in the Irene character, the Arcadena character. Yes, yes. But, and my mom has played Arcadena character, too, as an actress. I believe she played it um, in Seattle or Syracuse, one of those places. But, uh, but uh, you know, in fact, the, the actress angle of the seagull is very... Uh, important because many, uh, there are like four great actress roles in there and um, in, a, in a career actresses can play all, all of them and often do. And so I've had many of the actresses ha in the film who played some of the older characters have also played Nina in their, in their nice. youth. So everybody's familiar with the other roles. Well it's Uta Hagen, didn't she, um, she, uh, she famously played I think with the Lunts, with uh, Joan Lunt or something wow. like that uh, in the 50s. Wow. Joan and Alfred Lunt, right? right? Right. Wow, I have it. The 40s or the 30s, the Lunts. Wow. Okay, am the I, Lunts did I mess Broadway. up? I'm thinking, I'm like, did I mess up with the Lunts? I thought it was the Lunts. The Lunts were like the 30s, 40s, and 50s. So they, they could have been the old couple to her young Nina. Absolutely. So we'll have to check Wait, that who, out. Wait, who was it? Uh, I want to say, um, Uta Hagen. Uta Hagen. It was her debut. Old. Uta yeah. Hagen's like, yeah. Yeah. 39. So, so this was like Lunts. in the 40s or 50s. I believe it was the Lunts. So. Uta and the Lunts. Right. You're going to edit this, of course. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so, man. So, yes. um, okay, so, so you, uh, at what point you wrote, the, how long was the process from you start to write it and today? You're premiering it in L.A. Five years. Five years? Yeah. So you spent two years writing with her? No, I, sp I spent it three days writing it. Okay. Yeah. And then once you had it written, yeah. you I started shopping it around. Shopping it around, yeah. And then all of a sudden somebody with a little money said, oh, I like that. And we started out to make a very modest film um, on HD uh, for sh short, short money. And then all of a sudden, different people started to get associated. And, and a, a guy who I knew who was an industry guy and was an executive producer says, do you want to meet this cinematographer? And the cinematographer says, well, that's such a beautiful script. And this is such a beautiful location you found. You should do it on film. And I said, oh, come on, film is very expensive. He goes, well, what if I could get it? Uh, for you for, for cheap. And I said, that would be great. Let's try, let's find out. So he introduced uh, me to Fuji and Kodak both. And I spoke with both of them and pitched my project and uh, negotiated. And they wanted to sell me film for like, you know, 30 cents a foot or down to 18 cents. And I said, no, I can't do it unless, you know, unless it's free, you know, because it's just too expensive. And so the, so the Fuji company actually uh, came through. Nice. J Japan made the decision that it was worth, you know, you know, telling this story on film. And Panavis Panavision loaned us the free cameras. You shoot on 35? Uh, on 35, yeah. Oh, very nice. Panavision cameras. Uh, the shooter is Don Fauntleroy, who shot um, uh, with Billy Wilder and with Richard Donner and, uh, let's see, Blake Edwards and Steven Spielberg. So I think he was on Goonies. He did North and South and it's a big cinematographer, all the Jeepers Creepers movies. As a director, he's done a bunch of stuff, like man, a lot of monster stuff, like Anaconda. But he's a very talented uh, cinematographer. And uh, we talked about building a very lush, uh, almost old-fashioned look to the film, like it was a sort of technicolor romance of the 50s that Lana Turner might have starred in, or Troy Donahue or someone like that, right? How did you um, how did you put your crew together? Was he the first was he the uh, first person to that you got together? No, the first person we got was a, uh, it started like this. Laura and I had the idea, and um, we it was really just the idea that started the the snowball. And I rented a space, a rehearsal space, and we started getting actors in and casting it. And we started looking at actors and doing readings and parties and just getting attention for the project. And then we did an official casting where we actually threw it open to anybody in LA to come in for the roles. And that's how we got Travis and Trigger and some of the other major roles. And some of the other roles were, were introduced through friends and producers in the industry. So uh, when you, uh, once you had it cast, mm -hmm. uh, how long was the production? 
uh, 11 days of shooting. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. Bravo. <laughs> yeah, right? Wow. We, and that location, I mean, it was all done in one location. One location and the beach scenes. And there were like and maybe four, four yeah. different uh, like uh, costume changes? Like, was At it? least, yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, some of the actors got to change more than others, but... Um, but yes. Yeah, that location. How did location, you how did you come with that? Uh, that was a location. Um, it was really interesting. We we met a uh, we were in a coffee shop and there was this really cute dog sniffing at our feet and uh, and we looked down and we started talking to this dog and the dog's uh, mistress was this nice woman who said who wanted to be friends. We became friends and she said. And she says, well, this sounds good, your movie. What do you need? Can I help? I said, well, we need a beautiful location on Ma in Malibu with, you know, above the crashing waves with, uh, with uh, guest houses and winding paths. She goes, oh, I think I know exactly the place. So she brought me over there and introduced me to the Harrisons, Richard and Francesca Harrison. And they were really nice, and we... Um, and we agreed to shoot the film there. It's, it's amazing in Los Angeles the introductions that a dog will bring about. Absolutely. This dog <laughs> looked exactly like Asta from The Thin Man. Nice. That cute little dog. So you sound like a film buff. You've made yeah. a couple of references. Yeah. I, you know, I grew up watching the Million Dollar Movie and the Late Late Show in New York. So you know, it's like films, films were really part of my growing up. My mom was in movies too, so I watched, watched her work. Well, you mentioned so. she was an actress. Yeah, she was in a bunch of stuff. She was in a Hollywood movies and uh, European movies. Her name was Rita Gam, is Rita Gam. And, uh, so I grew up uh, both on sets and, uh, and in the theater. So I got to, uh, to know a lot of actors. So did, she, did you grow up in New York theater then, pretty I much? I grew up in New York theater, yeah. I grew up in New York. And my mom would come out here in the summer times and work still. But her big Hollywood career was before I was born, mostly. She, I think she was with MGM. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't remember all the that The end stuff. of the studio system. She was the end of the studio system, yeah. She made a lot of pictures with uh, good people. And then she did some independent films. She won the Berlin Silver Bear for No Exit in, uh, from John Paul Sartre. I think nice. that was 61 or 2. And, uh, you know, she had a good career. So you finished the film. Yeah. Uh, did you uh, do the film festival circuit, which just premiered now? So how what, did you do the two-year festival circuit? No, we didn't do any festival circuit. I mean, it's, we we went to a couple festivals and just showed it, just because we you know we were we wanted to travel and we were tired of uh, just we just finished it and we wanted to like show it to different people. But so we showed it once in Monaco and we showed it <laughs> once in Arizona, and uh, they're both really um, interesting experiences and. Uh, Jerome, Arizona was really good because it was a tiny little festival and it was this beautiful little town up on a mountain and most of the films were horror films and it was very hot out there. So I remember wondering why are there so many families that have come to our film, which is a romantic film, but it's not a, a kid's film, but there were kids there. And um, well, it was because there were all these, it, the choice was that or horror and so they came to see reality, which is its own kind of horror <laughs> in a way with Chekhov, even though it's beautiful. And, and, I, and as uh, the film played with all these little kids in there, I realized they understood it. They understood the dynamic of the relationships between the characters, how these different characters were interacting. They understand when love is there and when love is not there. They understand when people try harder to get something and they can't get it and they want to keep trying and then they understand that. That's what kids go through every day just to get what they want. And as a, adults, we forget about that, but it's exactly the same kind of behavior that we in, exhibited when we were kids and wanted things, this desire for love. And so Chekhov's characters are seeking love, and, and these kids got that completely. And they were totally engaged with the film, and that's what convinced me that the film had, you know, had some value and was so worthwhile. So when, when was the screening? That was in, uh, in June, I believe. In June, and yeah. so now it's December. Now it's December. Uh, I mean, so like right now, you, you uh, released it for a week here in L.A. Right, in L.A. And is that it was showing that was, that was um, really, that's to qualify for the Oscars, yes. so that I can uh, make some noise on behalf of the guys who did the score, on behalf of the actors, some of whom aren't getting any younger, and uh, so that we can really give this film a push and let it find its home. I think it'll live a long time. I think it could live on Lifetime, on Oprah Winfrey's channel, anywhere where people are engaged in questions of, of romance or spirituality, because it does touch on both of these subjects. Almost like the old uh, Bravo channel, back when they used to show like intelligent theater. 
before the housewives. Did that? Did yeah. Before the housewives. Remember that Bravo used to be Almost, the theater yeah, channel. Yeah. Okay, so you're showing here in a week. Yep. Hopefully qualifying for uh, some awards. How are you? Um, in what ways are you advertising or promoting to to get to the Academy uh, viewership or voting? Well, membership? I don't know. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna go on the radio if, if they'll they'll let me and offer free uh, free admission for voting members for just show your you know your Academy membership and. Uh, and come on in and watch it over the New Year's. We're playing it uh, over the New Year's through, through the second. So, um, so come down to the theater, and if they're SAG members, I think just come on in. How, how often is it showing? Uh, it's showing twice a day. A seven nine. Seven, seven nine. Generally on New Year's Day, it's going to be two, and uh, I think it's going to be two and eight. Uh, you'll have to check Brown Paper Tickets or Downtown Independence website for exact. Times. Every day it's slightly different, but it should be well, This is an exciting night. time for you and your film, and I look well, forward so to much, meeting Sean. Lara and the Appreciate cast. It very much. Thank you. This is Johnny White with Creative Current. Have a good night. <laughs>